Can you believe it? We're actually in the final session of part one of Project Unity. And what a journey it's been studying the book of Ephesians. And we have learned so much. In fact, that very first session, we learned the significance of the geographical position and even historically and uh, economically, the location of Ephesus was very significant for the furtherance of the gospel. In the second session, we talked about the significance of mentors, mentors such as Aquila and Priscilla, and even Paul. We learned of how Paul had met Aquila and Priscilla, tent makers, in the city of Corinth, and he mentored them there. And then when he went on to the city of Ephesus, he took them with him. And he left them behind in the city of Ephesus as he went on to the city of Jerusalem. And we know that Apollos uh, came to the city of Ephesus and began teaching. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him and realized that he didn't have the whole gospel that he was teaching, they pulled him aside and they began to mentor him and adding to his knowledge what he didn't already know. And so that was such an important part of what happened in the city of Ephesus. And then we learned about the significance of being in Christ with Pastor Amanda and Pastor Kyle. And we learned about discovering one's identity with Pastor Peggy. And then in the next sessions, we learned about the resurrection of the dead with Pastor Bruce and the two becoming one in Christ with Pastor Rob. And this session, Pastor Peggy talked about the big mystery that Paul came to reveal. So now we want to go into the second Uh, part of Ephesians 3, actually in verse 14 through 19. And it reads like this. For this reason, I bend my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in the inner self, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. You see, Paul's desire was to see the saints in Ephesus becoming healed, whole, and a mature body of believers that were capable of coming together as one unified body with Christ as the head. Not children bickering over petty things such as the Corinthians did when they said, we are of of Apollos and we are of Cephas, we are of Paul. No, he had more of a vision like the one that Ezekiel recorded where he prophesied to the dead bones, and they came together to form a mighty army. They came together as one. Paul was envisioning the the people of Ephesus coming together as one mature body. No longer infants tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that darkened the church house steps. No, They were those that had their senses exercised by reason of use to be able to discern both good and evil. So Paul prayed for specific gifts as a father prays for his children. They were riches that he asked that they be granted. Riches from the storehouse that he called glory. So what are the riches of glory? Let's begin by defining the word glory first. In the English language, according to Google, glory means high renown or honor, something won by notable accomplishments or achievements. It's magnificence or something of great beauty. Or the third meaning could be something to take pride in or take pleasure in. It's not a term we use frequently, but in everyday conversation, We might actually say something such as this man's wealth or his accomplishments or his successes are his glory. It is that quality that brings one honor and significance. Like winning the Nobel Peace Prize, 
or discovering a cure for some dangerous disease. We are more apt to use the word glorious, however, when we're describing an object of great beauty. The Greek word glory is doxa, and it means dignity, honor, or something that creates admiration. The Hebrew word for glory is the word kabod, which signifies something heavy or something that has great weightiness. It can mean honor, respect, distinction, beauty, worth, value, and importance. This can be literal and it can be figurative. Experiencing this weighty glory should result in praise and a reverential fear, often with a sense of awe. Glory can be encapsulated as the weightiness of God's presence and it is the embodiment of who he is, of what he possesses, and what he represents. Romans 9.23 says this, He did so in order that he might make known or might reveal the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, that's us, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So what are riches? According to the Greek definition, riches might pertain to wealth, money, possessions, abundance, and richness. I also believe that it refers to the very essence of God's personality. He wants to perfect us and make us complete by filling us with His glory, that we might grow up into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 4.12. You see, God imparts His very DNA into us. We all know that it is the DNA of a mother and a father that come together to form an infant, one who has similar traits and characteristics of its parents. So you see, God imparts his DNA so that we might grow up to look like him and to act like him. We were made in the very image of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As God's children, we qualify for all the riches that he possesses, those that he possesses in his warehouse of glory. So glory encapsulates the weightiness of God's presence, and it is the embodiment of who he is, what he represents, and what he possesses. We know that the glory is brilliant as Moses' face after sitting in the presence of God for 40 days was so brilliant that when he came off the mountain, he had to put a veil over his face so that the people could talk with him because the brilliance was so much they couldn't even look on it. So what are the riches of glory? It is all that God is, all that he possesses, love, joy, peace, knowledge, wisdom, discernment, love, well, actually, the list is endless. It also includes the cattle in a thousand hills, all of the earth, all of its wealth, and all of its treasures. I like to think of it as a warehouse of glory. It stores everything we could ever want or need according to God's plan for mankind. And where is the warehouse located? And how can we access the riches that are stored there? In his presence. That's where we find it, in his presence. So this is the conclusion of part one of our Project Unity. Part two will begin again in the fall. And I just want you to remember that we also have a Bible study it's based on Entering the Presence of God by uh, Derek Prince, and that's in room 205, upstairs at 9 o'clock every Sunday morning. So until next time, God bless.